the compulsory outdoor sessions for um, primary schools. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and then as environment minister, she brought in some amazing things. Um, the whole um, ethos of sustainability being integrated into Welsh government policy comes from Jane. Um, she founded the, the sort of um, future generations and well-being um, policy that's only recently come out. But that process was started by you, I think, wasn't it, Jane? And, um, and from that came the founding of Natural Resources Wales, which is also a way of integrating land management and environmental policy much better across Wales. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to... Oh, yeah, and also I should say, uh, Jane's now um, uh, pro vice chancellor <laughs> <laughs> for sustainability at Trinity St David's University. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll hand over to Jane. Thank you very much. <laughs> pleased to be here today because I think this is a brilliant project and all those of you who've, uh, who've already been up there probably know that and you've managed to get an amazing day to do it. I did it in the rain but uh, I, could, I could see the potential and all those of you who I hope are going at three o'clock please do go because Simon was bringing it to life now in terms of uh, what the plans are but you need to go up and just see the extraordinary location to really feel what the opportunities are and to really feel how there's a very, very special place uh, there that can be of service in so many ways to the future. Service to people's body and soul, which I think is always very important, but also where the academics and um, Sophie Wynne-Jones at the back of the room and her colleague over in Leeds, uh, sorry, from Bangor University and her colleague at Leeds University, you know, will be researching, providing an evidence base that can contribute towards um, uh, further work that we hope, for example, the <coughs> government will want to support through Natural Resources Wales or elsewhere in the future. And uh, it's interesting when Simon said that um, uh, I, uh, I, I did spend a long time as Education Minister. I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed it. But my very favourite headline, <laughs> which is highly relevant to this project, my very favourite headline in the whole of my 12 years in the Welsh Government was, Minister makes children play in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> I just oh. wish I still had it. But it was so brilliant, you know, because yeah. up here, you know, this is a, probably about, two, must be about 2006, six seven because I'd int introduced the foundation phase into schools and assigned into primary schools that insisted that everybody had to have an outdoor classroom and they had to have access to a garden and they had access to growing. So I'd introduced all of that. And then, and then this um, young journalist ran up and he said, uh, expecting to be told no, you know, it does the, uh, is, it, is it true that the minister's going to make children play in the rain? And of course he was told yes. Um, he was also told that there's no such thing as bad weather, it's the wrong clothes. So as part of the money we gave to primary schools, we gave them money. So that you're, uh, many of you will have seen, I don't know what it's like now, but in the early stages, you know, rows of Wellingtons and little raincoats that came with the early money to make sure that people could go out and play in the rain. But if anybody ever finds the picture of me telling children to play in the rain, please let me have it, <laughs> because it, it will be the one that, uh, that goes with me to my grave. Um, in terms of this particular project, I thought I'd just say a little bit from uh, the book by uh, Ferrell, by George Monbiot, because I wouldn't be standing in this room without this book. Um, George is a, uh, I call him the senior patron of the project, but um, Simon is non-hierarchy, so he says we're both equal. However, <laughs> I would say that George has a far greater claim uh, to be a patron of this project than I have, because what he did in this book, published in 2013, was really start to look in a very exciting way at the, how you can open up both the history and possibilities of our landscapes and you know, what, what you might want to look at to break the straight lines into endless branches, to free our land from absent administrators, to rewild both the landscape and ourselves. And I think it's a potent notion and he calls it searching for enchantment on the frontiers of rewilding. But I think what, what attracted me um, to it was 
Um, back, back in, I think it must have been about 2011, I, I stood down um, from politics in 2011 um, because I'd, done, I'd always said I was going to do three terms and I'd done the two ministerial posts I was really most interested in. I'm an educator by profession, I'm an environmentalist by inclination. What was I going to do next? I'd go and do both of them in the university, which is what I do now. But I decided to stand down on the day that we found out um, uh, in August 2009 that the small holding we wanted to buy, which we now live on and we, we manage as an organic small holding in St Donald's, that our bid had been successful. And it was a sort of an epiphany moment because I was actually out at sea, out with Sea Trust looking for dolphins that afternoon. Um, and Sea Trust counts, um, uh, you know, dol dolphins out in Cardigan Bay, and we saw a pod of 300 dolphins. And so there I am in this pod of 300 dolphins, and I get this phone call saying um, they've accepted your offer. And I'm thinking the world doesn't get much better than this. <laughs> and it's that whole notion about nature, actually, for me. And um, you know, even if I think about where I am now, every time it rains. Um, where I am now. We are organic, but the farm above us is not. So I've just watched, in the last few days' rain, I've just watched all their weed killer mm. off their 20-odd um, acres of fields pour onto my garden. And I know that that will have a detrimental effect, and I will lose particularly tender plants. And it's this notion that we, we forget that what we do in one place has an impact on another. And what was really interesting for me when I first came and looked at, the, um, uh, at, at this project was, of course, we came up past Glass Poof, where houses had had to be rebuilt, where the stream had burst its bank, where the road was destroyed. And all over Wales and elsewhere, you will see examples of where further down the hill <laughs> we are seeing detrimental effects from water. Now, I just spent two weeks in Nepal. Um, very emotional two weeks. Uh, 29 years ago, I worked on a project in a village called Barpath, which is about 10,000 feet up um, below where there's almost an interchange between the, the Annapurna Mountains and the Himalganesh Mountains. And I fell in love with the place and the people and their management of their local economy. No electricity. We walked there. It took us five days to walk there from Gorka. I've just been back because in 2015, many of you will be aware, there was an earthquake. And, um, and when I saw on the news the epicentre of the earthquake, I, sorry, I saw my village um, that I knew so well. And the village is two miles from the epicentre of the earthquake and was absolutely destroyed, completely and utterly destroyed. And so I've been raising money for it over the last three years. And in the last, so in the last two weeks, I've gone back I had the same Serda, the, the expedition leader, the Nepali expedition leader, who, were, who led me out back in, uh, when he was 17, back in um, 1989. And we went back up, and apart from electricity, which is now there, brought as, as a result of um, microelectricity, hydroelectricity, by a, 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 a resident village, um, the village is transformed in the most negative way possible. Because some of the fields are still there, but the houses are gone. And most people are living in tents, three years on. And they're having to build new kinds of houses to withstand earthquakes or anything else. But what was most fascinating, in many ways, was you know, their, their, their humor, their resilience, because they've just faced everything up in that kind of extreme environment. And they are most worried about climate change because they need two crops a year to survive, and now they're not getting two crops a year reliably. Where the water used to uh, pour off the mountain in certain places, it now no longer does that in reliable ways. Or if it does, it might by bypass the village altogether because the sheer force of it has now carved a whole new. Um, and they, are, and they, they, they manage their relationship with nature in a really positive way. And yet they are experiencing our and others' um, complete mismanagement of nature. 
And it's, it's been striking me for years. I mean, I did try and introduce and very strongly support Paul. Uh, if you don't know Paul Allen, Paul Allen from, from, from CAP here. Paul's work on Zero Carbon Britain. 30 years work, Paul. <laughs> and I've only been around for the last 20. <laughs> so, but, you know, Paul, Paul's work has got resonance. And he was saying that only yesterday, Claire Perry, the, um, uh, the Minister for Climate Change in this government, in the Conservative government in Westminster, is talking about a zero carbon agenda and making announcements later this year. I think people are waking up to things now. They're waking up to the plastic, they're waking up to the climate change and others. Which means there's a chance now to experiment and actually think about over what period of time can we replenish and regenerate nature? What does nature need to give it a better start? So I just wanted to um, use a, 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 a couple of quotes from, from George Monbiot. This is, for, this is directly from him. Rewilding, to me, is about resisting the urge to control nature and allowing it to find its own way. It involves reintroducing absent plants and animals, and in a few cases, culling exotic species which cannot be contained by native wildlife, pulling down the fences, blo blocking the drainage ditches, but otherwise stepping back. The ecosystems that result are best described not as wilderness, but as self-willed governed not by human management, but by their own processes. Rewilding has no end points, no view about what a right ecosystem or a right assemblage of species looks like. It does not strive to produce a heath, a meadow, a rainforest, a kelp garden, or a coral reef. It lets nature decide. The ecosystems that will emerge in our changed climates and our depleted soils will not be the same as those which prevailed in the past. The way they evolve cannot be predicted which is one of the reasons why this project enthralls. While conservation often looks to the past, rewilding of this kind looks to the future. The rewilding of both land and sea could produce ecosystems, even in such depleted regions as Britain and Northern Europe, as profuse and captivating as those that people now travel halfway around the world to see. One of my hopes is that it makes magnificent wildlife acceptable to everyone. While some primitivists see a conflict between the civilised and the wild, the rewilding I envisage has nothing to do with shedding civilization. We can, I believe, enjoy the benefits of advanced technology while also enjoying, if we choose, a life richer in adventure and surprise. Rewilding is not about abandoning civilization, but about enhancing it. It is to love not man the less, but nature the more. I do not think that extensive rewilding should take place on productive land. It is better deployed in the places, especially in the uplands, in which production is so low that farming continues only as a result of the taxpayer's generosity. Some people see rewilding as a human retreat from nature. I see it as re-involvement. I see rewilding as an enhanced opportunity for people to engage with and delight in the natural world. And I think that is absolutely spot on and as a sort of framework for what you're doing here <coughs> it's all there and the notion that we don't um, you know George particularly um, says at much more length that there are areas of particularly the size of a country like Britain which are going to have to remain really productive in terms of food sources and everything else but if we don't understand how nature works because we've basically managed the hell out of it uh, for the, for, for the last 50 years, then we don't also know what we can do to replenish and recreate for the future. So I think a project like this, and I'm, when I looked at the list of people who were supporting it, when I saw the university uh, involvement, when I saw the fact that, I mean, and one of the trustees um, uh, works closely with, uh, well, works in Welsh government, looking at issues around the um, uh, agriculture support mechanisms, suddenly, we can see that there could be something really special in a small project that is able to become bigger and bigger and actually in doing so demonstrate what a restorative habitat looks like. Those of you who go walking um, in, 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 in Europe, and I've done, I've done a lot of that, is the first time I came upon um, uh, a wildlife area in Spain, one that you couldn't enter without a pass, where you were regulated in the number of people who, who went, 
you were allowed to carry nothing that you could leave behind. Um, uh, I remember thinking, we need this uh, in the United Kingdom. And I remember looking for a while to see if there were any possibilities in Wales where that could be the place. But I have to say that the um, powers that be never thought that the UK was big enough to have that kind of approach. But what we do know, because the, the evidence for the, from those places in Europe, in a range of different countries in Europe, is we do know that there are species surviving there which have gone elsewhere. So we do know that actually giving this our best attention will give us a huge new range of possibilities in policy terms in Wales and more widely as to what needs to be done as we move on our journey towards a low carbon future. And if we really think about what the role of trees in our lives, both the givers of our inspiration uh, and our exhalation and storage of carbon, uh, we know that what this project is going to do with the support of those people who are here in, in this room is actually create a major new carbon store for Wales. So I wish you all the best with it and I'm really pleased to be invited here today to contribute towards celebrating this first Open Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. It's really, uh, it's really an honour to have you here so, uh, and be supporting our project in this way. So, uh, yeah, thank you for being our patron. It's great. So yeah, we'll do some uh, questions, if anyone's got questions for either me or Jane, in fact. Um, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned climate change a lot. Now, how are you going to source these, either new species or existing species? Are you going to try and get them from a range of different environments to cope with a changing future, or do you source them from uh, a similar sort of environment as to what you've got there at the moment? The tree species? Well, trees or whatever, yeah. Okay, um, but I think that you have to sort of, uh, you know, answer the question, it depends which, um, which species we're talking about. So with the trees, um, they, some of the seed for the trees has been collected from our sites and we'll be doing more of that. Um, and growing in the nursery at Havard Estate um, near um, Andre de Grosse. And um, so that's not very far away. So there'll be quite a low carbon footprint for, for the trees there. Um, in terms of the animals, the, the horses, the three horses we've got so far came from Lampeter, so they haven't had to travel very far. And we're, you know, we're thinking we might get a stand, there's three mares at the moment, we might get a stand in. So there'll be one more movement there and then they can breed. But obviously, you'll need new genes coming in for a, a herd that small. So, but yeah, we just hope we wouldn't have to move them too far. Uh, red squirrels are coming from further afield. They, they're captive bred in um, Kent at the moment. But what we'd like to do is set up something with um, some local farmers. We, we met a farming family who wants to do captive breeding of red squirrels. And they live near Talabont south of here. So um, it would be interesting if we could start something with them. Um, water voles, as I said, would be translocated in from a development site. But yeah, I is that the sort of question you're asking about how far the animals are travelling? Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, we can look at each, each animal, we have a different story. Yeah. 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 But, um, I'm thinking back, we lived in New Zealand for a long time, and one of the big controversies there say in the South Island with the reintroduction, well, not reintroduction, but in the future, species from the North Island could start colonising in the South. Yeah. And when we were doing tree planting, say around Christchurch, we were always aware that they wanted to have a local source of seed yeah. and provenance, but you've got to keep in mind what's going to happen in the future as well, and things could change as far as even species composition and so on. Indeed, with, with wooden composition. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the problem we've got with second guessing what trees to plant, you know, in a changing climate, we don't actually know which way the climate will change in the UK. 
you know, it's, it could get hotter and drier, but um, you know, if we lose the Gulf Stream, yeah. it could get a lot colder. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, but I think most of our native trees have got a very wide range. You know, pine, you know, it grows in from southern France up to north of Scotland. So I think we're quite good for those. And you know, ash, similar range. Not that we can plant ash at the moment, <laughs> but um, the uh, Pilara disease. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think most most species have got such a wide range. You know, I think, and also the uncertainty. The best policy is to literally just keep planting what's growing locally okay. and let it evolve itself mm -hmm. rather than second guessing. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, I'm sure you know that uh, upland waders in Wales. Uh, are in a bad state at the moment. Yes. Wales has lost 81% of its breeding curlews since yes. 1990. Lapwings, similarly, in yeah, population crashing. Yeah. I wondered how much, uh, if, if any part of this project is, is geared to helping their recovery. Yes, totally. Um, yeah, I'm particularly fond of curlews as well. It's National Curlew Day today. <laughs> is it? Seriously, yeah. it's National Curlew Day National today. Curly day today. <laughs> My favourite word. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, not native to this area, but I, you know, I first moved here in 1986, and I, I remember the sounds from the estuary yeah. in the winter, mm -hmm. and I remember the sounds of curlew in the hills in the summer, mm -hmm. and that's gone. Mm -hmm. And it's so... It's so sad, the hills are really silent now. Um, it would be lovely if we could contribute to those birds, curly and the other way that's coming back. Um, you know, the thing specifically we're, we'll be doing to help is the habitat restoration, but also we're not going to be using any pesticides at all on the land, so our grazing animals won't be you know, poisoning the landscape basically for insects. So hopefully by their food source, returning, you know, crane flies and all the other insects will be helping them in that way. But, um, you know, it'd be interesting to look into bird reintroductions as well, and whether that's a sort of feasible thing with, with curlew yeah. and the other waders. And yeah, I just research, don't know anything sorry. about it. Yeah. The, the research the BTO has done so far suggests that predator control is actually a, a key ingredient to letting them yeah, I've heard of that, but it's also interesting to note that there's some webcam footage of um, sheep eating curly yes, eggs. Yes, I know. So you know, it's like we might we might sort of try managing without sheep and without pesticides, do the habitat restoration yeah. first, and then we you know we have to sort of it's years in the future. Yeah. So I don't think it'd be my sort of decision about predators. And they avoid I doubt if it's sorry. within the ethos of our project to do that. And they, 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 they avoid woodlands, so you have to make sure you don't cover too much of it. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like <laughs> each species has got so you yeah. know, like if we wanted black grouse to come back, yeah. they need trees, they need that sort of three dimensions. So, and birch leaves is an important part of their food source. So, you know, it would be a matter of having a varied mm. landscape cater for all these species. Out of interest, we've got in um, next valley along, was it the one after, at uh, Dunning, um, we've got quite a lot of curly. Have you got curly? Yeah, no. Right, that's so, so interesting. It's, it's, it's quite, yeah, it's quite near to the Cambrian Wildwood site and it's also hopefully going to be linked up um, at some point, so. Yeah, so that's a yeah. site. That is a designated site of special scientific interest for its heathland and blanket bog interest. And um, the grazing management there has been with horses for the last 20 years, is it? Yeah. And again, that's um, unmanaged horses. They haven't been handled, so there's been no pesticides on the land in that time. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of guesswork what are the main factors, but obviously they can come back. Without any, there's been no predator control on there either. And I've also seen red grouse there, they've come back in the last few years, and hen harrier, I've seen hunting there. So it's amazing how quickly these birds can return. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the RSBB site, and it's here, they were experimenting with 
electrified fence seem to keep the predators away from the bird who I don't know yeah, how successful they've been, but that's, that's been their main yeah. problem. Yeah, I bet it has. Yeah. 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 Simon. Hello. I'm just expressing the hope that NRW is fully supportive of this excellent project. Um, I only say that because until the year 2000, I used to work in West Wales for Countryside Council for Wales. Yeah. And I know at that time there was a certain amount of unease and lack of certainty about the wisdom and the mechanics of rewilding as we're thinking about it now. Yeah. Have things changed? Things have changed quite dramatically, you'll be pleased to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the turning point was the publication of Feral. Um, I know, you know, I was involved with a group called the Wildland Network, and we were holding conferences from uh, about 2003, I think, 2004, to 2009. And um, it was very much sort of in-house thing. We were talking to other conservation bodies, um, DCW, English Nature, Forestry Commission, but not really going wider than that to the general public. And um, people sort of politely listened, but didn't think it had any real sort of, you know, any traction or any interest for the general land management. So I think they thought of us as a sort of minority group of nutcases, that sort of thing. But, um, and I remember, you know, we stopped doing conferences in 09. By 2013, the Wildlife Trust um, directors meeting was saying, oh, we've, uh, that's blown over, hasn't it? That little sort of trend for rewilding. So, you know, we'll just get back to what we were doing. And uh, that was about a month before Feral was published, so they, they had to eat their words a little bit. But um, it wasn't a public announcement or anything. But, uh, so they, they, you know, that the Wildlife Trust have really embraced the ideas now. Um, RSPB as well are really interested, National Trust and government bodies like NRW, again, yeah, interested. And, 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 and the thing with big organisations like NRW, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the different personalities. So, you know, we've got a lot of support from some quarters. Other people are more sceptical. You know, on the forestry side, they've got their commitments to produce a certain amount of timber. So, you know, for the sawmills and all the infrastructure for, for wood production. So, you know, we've got a challenge there with trying to persuade, you know, the government forestry areas to be uh, put to native woodland. But having said that, there is a lot of that happening. So they're doing quite a good job and but being quite a sort of quiet about it. So, yeah, I'd say anyway, it's a very, very different landscape. Um, political landscape now than it was in, two, in the year 2000. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add two points to that? I mean, the first one is that um, before I left, um, George sent a series of very detailed questions, about 30 questions, to um, both to me and to the UK Government Environment Minister at the time, because some aspects are, were, were wider than Welsh responsibilities. And initially, when they came in, and he and I talked about it, and I said I would do really detailed responses. I think it would be fair to say that in early 2011, there wasn't a great appetite among the officials inside Welsh Government to respond to challenges around rewilding. But I thought it was really important. So we did send a really, really detailed response, and some of aspects of which appear in, 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 in the book. But I think what was... What was in many ways most interesting about that was it was also the time that we'd agreed to create what is now the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So the combination of having an act focused on sustainability, now an environment act um, with, a, with a set of um, targets within it, uh, and um, a kind of challenge to public policy, in a sense managing more traditional monolithic agriculture, all these things were coming together um, and I think there is probably the biggest opportunity now 
as a result of a range of legislation that's in Wales that is still untapped. So the legislation has been passed, but people haven't yet seen big policy changes in delivery. But I think that opportunity is really there now, because in any local authority area, you could propose a project like this that would absolutely fit with the aims and objectives of the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. And all public bodies in all local authorities in Wales are charged with that responsibility. So there is a huge you know, opportunity that, that this may be the first of what I hope will become many projects across Wales where, where the opportunity can be taken. Yeah. Yeah. I've just a quick question. question. I'm going to check the time, sorry. Um, oh, it's... <laughs> oh, yeah. Just a quick question then, just following on from what you... <coughs> yeah. How do you um, see the Brexit having an impact on this in terms of financial sort of... Uh, no, Nobody, no. no. Do, do, do you think it will then? I mean, yeah. Do you I mean, one effect is, is a fairly minor effect, but you know, our plan for tree planting was to start it in uh, 2019-2020 season. But you know, when when I phoned up to find out about the, the Glastier Woodland Creation Grant, mm. I discovered that this is the last year they're operating it, mm. and I said, "What's coming after?" And they said, "We, we don't, don't know. know. Brexit." Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're doing tree planting this coming winter, um, 18, 19. But there is a clear talk of a 15% cut in environmental finance budget, isn't there? Yeah. Um, and also the thing about the common agricultural policy yeah. not being guaranteed after Brexit. So mm -hmm. that will make less incentive for grazing on uplands, mm -hmm. which at the moment is only sustained through the common agricultural policy. Yeah. yeah. So that might make more land available, or people, property yeah. landowners might be more willing to sell yes. projects like this because of you know, not having subsidies from the Yeah, I mean, it would be sad for upland farms if they yeah. can't carry on. And I suppose, you know, our sort of project at least provides a market for land if it has to be sold. Um, but, you know, that's sort of poor consolation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a heck of a lot of uncertainty around what on earth is going to happen. Um, you know, I think Brexit potentially will have a massive impact on the wider land use for sure. In terms of our project that Simon's outlining there, you know, there's, there's some things in terms of our sources of funding that, you know, okay, that will be, um, you know, but, um, the majority of our money has come from, you know, from donors giving money to, yeah. to, to be able to buy the land. Certainly in terms of revenue from tree planting, that's something that's coming from European funding. The ring fencing of, of, of environmental funding, I think you're raising really important questions there. I guess it's more sort of that what's going to happen to wider up from land use and, and farming. Yeah. And I mean, one of the most positive things that we're trying to think about here is the way that, you know, we're not suggesting we want to rewild everything and rewild, you know, kind of 